it's Kyle with Liberty Me, here with Dan Beer, master and benevolent overlord of the skeptical libertarian and the least popular man in the Ginny McCarthy household. Hey Dan, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, uh, hey, Kyle. thanks for coming on, it's good to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. You had an article recently, want to see the future, open borders. Why do so many people, especially politicians, misunderstand the economic effects of immigration? Uh, I think politicians misunderstand it because their constituents misunderstand it. Um, you know, <laughs> you know uh, I, I have a family member who, who actually works in Congress, uh, and it's, it's really just hilarious how little congressmen and their staffers understand about anything that they write legislation on. Uh, you know, we all know that voters are ignorant, but they also elect ignorant people. And then these ignorant people get together and then they vote on bills, which is the sort of this double layer of ignorance and, you know, with a little bit of special interest spin injected into it. Um, so, you know, the reason why politicians don't get it is that their constituents don't get it. Um, politicians are, are not really that much smarter than their constituents. Um, and so, and if they were, and they told constituents things they didn't want to hear, they'd just be naturally selected out of office to vote in the people who do tell constituents what they want to hear. Uh, and the reason why people as a whole don't get immigration is that, you know, we just were naturally xenophobic. We, we have fear of different things. We have fear of foreigners. We're very tribalistic. Um, and it's, it's really telling if you look at the polls, people don't want to allow foreigners to move here. You know, they, they just don't. Um, by and large, a, very, a large majority of Americans don't want open borders. Uh, but once people are here, even people who come here illegally, we're more or less fine with them. You know, we see them as people. We see them as, a, as Americans. We see them as, as people who are working for us, <clears throat> and we're working for them. We're exchanging goods and services. They're part of our communities. They're part of our churches. They're neighbors, friends, uh, lovers. Uh, you know, they bring culture and art and music and science and investment and all these things. But we only see them like that once they're actually within the borders of the United States. Uh, and I think that really is the basic problem, is that we think there's something magical about these lines in the sand and that people on the other side of the lines, you know, they don't have any rights uh, that we need to care about. They don't have any concerns uh, that we need to take into account. <clears throat> And so we're just, we're naturally suspicious of, of the other. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter how many scientific studies you do that prove that free trade and open borders uh, is good for the economy and creates jobs and creates value for society. Um, people are always going to be just suspicious of, of uh, you know, swarthy foreigners who are conniving to sell us goods and services. Um, sure. They don't, sure. Like, they don't like the idea of, of competing against others. They're okay with competing against other Americans. They're in the club. Um, but they don't like having to compete against foreigners. Uh, and they, they think foreigners will take our jobs. They fall for a lot of economic fallacies like that. Uh, that there's a limited amount of work in, in the world and that work is a good thing. And if we have more people, then we'll divide the same amount of work and wages will go down. They just fall for lots of very common uh, mistakes in thinking about, um, in thinking about labor and, and markets generally. Well, then let's get down to brass tacks. What is the empirical data that you get from opening borders? What, what would the economic effects be? <clears throat> well, uh, in the United States, um, there's been just years and years and years of studies on this. And the economic effects of allowing more immigration and even our existing levels of immigration uh, is that it's positive. There's no study that I have read, no study by any respected economist, uh, which suggests that the effect on our economy is, is negative. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of studies say it will be small. Some studies say that it will have a, a negative, a small like the most negative study you can find about the effect of immigration on wages, which is only one part of the economy, but on the wages of people without high school degrees, the effect of all the immigration of the last 40 years has been to lower 
uh, people, the wages of people without high school degrees by 4%. Uh, this is the most negative study you can find. Uh, <clears throat> of course, also those 30 million people who immigrated to the United States in the last 40 years, uh, you know, they didn't just compete against us for wages. They also made things. They made businesses. They made, you know, they produced goods and services. And this lowered the price and the, and the cost of living for existing Americans. Uh, and <clears throat> generally, you know, contributed... Uh, a whole lot to our economy. We would not be better off. We would. Nobody thinks we would be richer if we had had no immigration over the last 40 years. Uh, so the effect in the, in the United States is positive uh, of immigration. And more immigration, would more people would create more goods and services, uh, and there would, be an adjust, uh, there would be an adjustment period as wages adjusted to a new equilibrium. Uh, but for the most part, most people are going to be much better off in the United States um, by allowing more immigration. Uh, the immigrants are going to be much, much, much better off. Uh, people in most of the rest of the world have very lousy economies to work in. Uh, they don't have a lot of capital. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have rights in many countries. Uh, so if you take the same person in the same level of education, the same skills, same job, same work, everything you can control for it, uh, in, in the United States, he will earn 400% more than he would earn in, in Ecuador. Ooh. In Yemen, in Yemen it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about 1,500% more just by moving to the United States where he has access to a market economy, a, a free market. So the immigrants are going to be much better off. The rest of society is going to be much better off in the long run. Uh, and, uh, you know... Generally speaking, everybody wins in the long run from immigration. A few people will lose when they have to compete against low-skilled immigrants. Uh, their wages will go down a little bit, uh, but most studies find they go back up again very quickly uh, as they find <coughs> other jobs that they're better suited to. Um, so, you know, in the United States, more immigration is a good thing. Uh, when you look at the world economy as a whole, when you look at all the restrictions of all the countries in the world, all the borders, all 150 or 200 countries in the world, uh, all the barriers to labor mobility, uh, the, the deadweight loss each year, I mean, this is deadweight loss is a term economists use to describe uh, the inefficiency of a particular policy in a particular market. Uh, so it, it's basically the amount of value we lose every year by having restrictions on labor mobility around the world. And it is 100% of GDP. Uh, there have been a number of very good studies on this, and they all come up with about that figure. Uh, <clears throat> so this basically means that we could produce twice as much stuff if we allowed people to simply move where they want to go, to, 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 to work where anyone is willing to give them a job. Um, and you know, world GDP today is eight hundred and is uh, sorry, eighty five trillion dollars. We could double that next year or in a, in a couple of years if world governments would basically just get out of people's way. You know, most of the value in the economy isn't in isn't in you know uh, machines and equipment. It's in people. It's in their minds. It's in their skills. It's in what they do. The main value I have and you have and most people have. Is, is their skills as workers and allowing people to sell those, their labor, their time, their skills to people anywhere in the world instead of just in the, the little geographic area they happen to be born in tremendously increases their opportunity and their potential to apply their talents and their labor in the most productive way. Uh, so, like I said, moving from Yemen to the United States, uh, a low-skilled worker will earn 15 times more uh, than he would in Yemen. Uh, in Ecuador, in Mexico, it's about uh, four or five times more. Would you move to California or Ohio or or Texas if you could triple your wages? In an instant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And anyone who thinks that they're going to stop illegal immigration by just building a fence... Uh, these people are on the are really on the margins of living well. I mean, these are poor people in poor countries, and if you think you're going to keep opportunity away from them 
by you know spending a couple extra bucks on border security, you're you're delusional, uh, and it's it's a delusion that's immensely costly. I mean, this is this is how I, I look at it. We could double world GDP, as I mentioned, by getting rid of border restrictions. Uh, there is no problem in the world that could not be made better off by having twice as much wealth produced each and every year. There just isn't. You know, whatever your whatever you think is wrong with the world, having the world be twice as wealthy is going to help solve that problem. Guaranteed. Uh, Brian Kaplan says, this isn't trickle-down economics. It's Niagara Falls economics. It is just a tidal wave of wealth, trillion-dollar bills on the sidewalk. And <clears throat> this policy isn't going to cost us anything. Just letting people move to where they want to go doesn't cost us anything. We don't have to give foreign aid. We don't have to have some grand central planning. Just letting individuals choose where they want to work and choose what they want to do is enough to double world GDP now. That's equivalent to the next 20 years of economic progress. The next 20 years of economic growth, uh, in my article I used, if the world economy keeps growing at the rate it's growing now, three three and a half percent a year, <clears throat> we'll double the world economy in 20 years. Uh, if it's less than that, if growth slows down, it'll be much, much longer. So we're basically trading the next 20 years of economic growth for, for what? Because we're afraid they'll use our welfare? So don't let them use welfare. Uh, you know, build a wall around the welfare state, not around the country. Uh, you know, get the good effects of immigration and, and free markets uh, without, you know, giving them free stuff. I mean, people don't come here to use welfare. They don't. They come here because they'll earn five times more money. I mean, it's <laughs> it's just really crazy. Um, uh, my friend Alex Narasta at the Cato Institute did a study on immigrant use of welfare. In almost every state, there's immigrants just aren't allowed to use welfare. Non-citizens, you just you just can't get it. Uh, it's, you know, they just don't want to give it to you. The only exception is uh, emergency medical care because we don't have we don't want to see people dying on the sidewalk. Um, so, but even the kinds of medical care and, and welfare benefits that immigrants are eligible for, they use them at much, much lower rates than, uh, Americans do at, at comparable levels. So for instance, if, if, uh, if Medicaid, one of the biggest entitlement bureaucracies at the federal, the federal level, uh, if Americans were using Medicaid at the rates that immigrants who are eligible to use it, used it, it would be 40% smaller. This, it, it's wow. really, really dramatic. And this is controlling for socioeconomic status and income and everything we can control for. Um, so it's just not true that they're coming here for welfare. They're coming here to work. They're coming here to work for you, to work for all of us, to create things for us, to create food and art and culture and goods and services, and to make their family better off. And if they send some money home, uh, that's great. You know, remittances, um, the money sent by immigrants back to their families in their home country, is $600 billion a year. $600 billion a year globally uh, are for remittances. There's no foreign aid program in the world that can equal that. There's not, and there shouldn't be, uh, because the money is actually going to families and people who, who really need it and know how to use it, not one government giving another government some money. Uh, so if we want to, if we want to help poor people, if we want to help rich people, if we want to help the environment, if we want to lower the deficit, if we, if we want to, you know, boost economic growth, just open the borders, just let people exercise the most fundamental freedom there is, the freedom to move. And I mean that, I don't, and I don't mean, you know, move to a different house or something. I mean, literally, Put one foot in front of another. This is the most basic freedom, the really inalienable freedom that people have, is to choose where to put their body and where to voluntarily direct their actions. And if we just let people do that, the world would be a completely different place. It would be, it would be the future, and and we could see the future now. Uh, and that was that was kind of my point. That's, that's incredible stuff, Dan, and we really appreciate you coming on. <clears throat> Love to have you back in the future. I mean, seriously, great stuff.
Awesome. Uh, anytime. All right. Have a great day. You too, Kyle.